Hey, White Station family. I've got a few books, a few of my favorite books, and I was going to read a little bit to you. I'm going to start off with some Mother Goose uh, nursery rhymes. Then I'm going to read a picture book, and then I'll read a chapter out of my all-time favorite book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. I'll do this every day so you can watch it, you can pause it, you can fast forward it, however you want to do it. And if you have the books at home, you're more than welcome to read along with me. All right, here it goes. So when I was young, I used to love to read my Mother Goose books. Now I had some that were from Walt Disney and I would read them all the time. And then I had a younger brother and sister and I read them all the time to them. So I'm going to read a little bit of these for your younger students. And also, if you're an older student and you never heard these, these might be fun. You can also jump rope to them because they make, they make great jump rope rhymes. Little Bo Peep. Little Bo Peep has lost her sheep and can't tell where to find them. Leave them alone and they'll come home and bring their tails behind them. Little Bo Peep fell fast asleep and dreamt she heard them bleating. But when she awoke, she found it a joke, for still they were fleeting. Then up she took her little crook, determined for to find them. She found them indeed, but it made her heart bleed, for they'd left all their tails behind them. It happened one day, as Bo Peep did stray, unto a meadow hard, hard by. There she espied their tails side by side, all hung on a tree to dry. She heaved a sigh and wiped her eye, and over the hillocks she raced and tried what she could, as a shepherdess should, that each tail should be properly placed. So that is a great uh, book, a uh, uh, nursery rhyme about Little Bo Peep. And here's, there's not really a picture, they're generic pictures that go along with the whole page. All right, I am going to go, um, I do have a question. Um, sorry, that was my phone. Miss Johnson, kindergarten teacher was calling me. I'll have to call her back in a little while. Uh, let me see if I can find my favorite one. Um, let's see, it's called Simple Simon. It's on page 25, so I'm gonna find Simple Simon. I used to have this memorized. I don't know if I still have it memorized. And that's a good thing for you to do as well as to memorize these because they are poems. And if you put them to music, they make songs. Simple Simon. Simple Simon met a pieman going to the fair. Says Simple Simon to the pieman, let me taste your ware. Says the pieman to Simple Simon, show me first your penny. Says Simple Simon to the pieman, indeed I have not any. Simple Simon went a-fishing for to catch a whale. All the water he could find was in his mother's pail. Simple Simon went to look. If plums grew on a thistle, he pricked his fingers very much, which made poor Simon whistle. He went to catch a dicky bird and thought he could not fail because he had a little salt to put upon its tail. He went for water with a sieve, but soon... It ran all through, and now poor Simple Simon bids you all adieu. I don't know if you know what a sieve is. A sieve is uh, something that you uh, usually bowl-shaped. It's like a half a sphere, and it has holes in it. Sometimes people call it a colander. So we put water in it, and all of the water went out. And I did think about this um, earlier in the, in the uh, nursery rhyme. There was the word thistle. Thistle is a type of plant, and you can look it up on the internet if your parents will let you, so you can see what it is. They're a beautiful plant. Um, they grow a lot in Scotland, and I've got a pen, so when we come back to school, I'll show you a pen. I've got a pen of a pewter thistle that I will show you. Um, when, we, when I read Little Bo Peep, you might have wondered what a bleat was. Well, a bleat was the sound that sheep make, and so there's all kinds of sounds that sheep make. There's you, you might have heard Bob Bob Black Sheep, and we may read that another day. Um, but bleeding is a sound that they make. If you have any questions about any of the words or where to find some more Mother Goose rhymes, email me at hamersw at scsk12.org, and I will guide you to the correct place. Or if you want a challenge or if you want me to read your favorite, just email me, and I will read your favorite if I've got it here at the house. You know, we're on... Um, 
kind of a self quarantine right now. So we're trying to stay safe and healthy and just like you are. All right. So the next book I'm going to read is a picture book called Frederick. And what I'll do is I'll read uh, a page or two and then I'll show you those two pages and then I'll flip the page and read that and show you the pages with that. So follow along in Frederick. And as I read, I want you to think who the main character or characters are where it takes place, maybe when it takes place. Does it take place pay, place in the past, the present, or the future? Did it? Is it taking place in the daytime, in the evening, at night, at dawn, which is early morning, or dusk, which is evening? Um, think about when it takes place, and then think about if there's a problem, and if there is a problem, did they come to a solution by the end of the story. So follow along as I read Frederick by Leo Leone, and there's tons of books by him, and I, I'm sure that Mrs. Fallhaber has shared those with you uh, in the library, and if not, I'm sure your teachers or your parents have too. So it's Frederick Leone. All right, here's the title page, and I wonder who that is. Hmm, is that a balloon or a flower? I can't tell. Maybe as we read along, we'll figure it out. Uh, it was written in 1967. That was 53 years ago. And it was, um, let's see if it's dedicated to anyone. Let's go to the dedication page. Nope, I don't see a dedication. Maybe when we get to the end of the book, because sometimes the dedication is at the end, we'll see. So written in 1967 by Leo Leone. And Leo Leone also did the collages in here. And a collage, you can ask Miss Shirley, is when you take a bunch of different types of things and you glue them together to make a picture. And it looks like this one's made out of paper, cut out paper and pasted on or glued on. All right, here we go. All along the meadow where the cows grazed and the horses ran, there was an old stone wall. Maybe when you get finished, you can figure out what your favorite page was, and you can make your own collage. In that wall, not far from the barn and the granary, a chatty family of field mice had their home. Hmm, those must be field mice that I'm seeing. And they've got their home in the brick, was it brick wall? No, I think it was a stone wall. But the farmers had moved away, the barn was abandoned, and the granary stood empty. And since winter was not far off, the little mice began to gather corn and nuts and wheat and straw. They all worked day and night, all except Frederick. Hmm, I bet that didn't make his family very happy that he wasn't working. So I wonder what a granary is. If I look at the context clues, I have words like corn and wheat and straw, and I think I know that all of those things are grains, so a granary must be where grains are kept. So that's what a granary is. That's a really pretty picture. Leo Leone did a great job making his collage. Look at the wheat. And here's some nuts, um, some leaves, and let's see if there's some straw. I'm going to look on the next page and see what I find on the next page. Frederick, why don't you work? They ask. I don't work. Oh, I'm sorry. I miss, I made a mistake. I apologize. I do work, said Frederick. I gather sun rays for the cold, dark winter days. Hmm. I wonder if that really counts as work. So you can see the field mice, they've got corn. Corn is another type of grain. You can see the sun is bright. And here's Frederick. It looks like he's maybe a little sad. His eyes are closed. What do you think? Let me put it up a little bit closer so you can see. And when they saw Frederick sitting there, staring out at the meadow, they said, and now, Frederick, I gather colors, answered Frederick simply, for winter is gray. Oh, wow. Look at the field mice gathering nuts. And here's Frederick thinking and looking off. 
and once Frederick seemed half asleep. Are you dreaming, Frederick? They asked reproachfully. But Frederick said, oh no, I'm gathering words, for the winter days are long and many, and we'll run out of things to say. Hmm, I notice where it says, uh, where it has the tag, are you dreaming, Frederick? They ask reproachfully. Hmm, instead of just said, they ask, they ask reproachfully. So it's a certain way that they ask. So he was not being, in their opinion, above reproach. It means that he might not have been doing what they thought that he should be doing. But he thought he should be gathering sun rays and colors and words for the winter. What do you think? The winter days came, and when the first snow fell, the five little field mice took to their hideout in the stones. Wow, it does look bleak, doesn't it? It's all gray and snowy. Poor little Frederick. I wonder what he's thinking. I wonder if they have enough grain and nuts and other things. In the beginning, there was lots to eat, and the mice told stories of foolish foxes and silly cats. They were a happy family. So here they are in their stone home, and they've got their nuts, and they're, they feel protected and safe and content. And here's some straw. Remember it said that there was some straw? It looks cozy. But little by little, they had nibbled up most of the nuts and berries. The straw was gone, and the corn was only a memory. It was cold in the wall, and no one felt like chatting. I wonder if you're feeling a little bit like that right now and not wanting to chat with anyone. I don't want you to feel like that. If you want to chat with someone, email me, and I'll be able to email you back. Or if your parents are on Facebook, come see me on Facebook. Then they remembered what Frederick had said about sun rays and colors and words. What, what about your supplies, Frederick, they asked. Mm, he's kind of perking up a little bit now. On the page before, he looked a little bit sad. Let me go back and show you. Look, he looked a little bit sad there, but now they're wanting him to share, and so he's looking a little bit happier. How can you tell he's looking happier? Is it something that he said? Is it in his eyes, in his demeanor? Talk to your family about it. Close your eyes, said Frederick, as he climbed to the, on a big stone. Now I send you the rays of the sun. Do you feel how their gold do you feel how their golden glow? And as Frederick spoke of the sun, the four little mice began to feel warmer. Was it Frederick's voice? Was it magic? Look at Frederick up there and the four of his family members below. They close his eyes and they're thinking about the warm sun. Today it's sunny outside and it's warm. It's a good day to go outside and ride your bike or do some sidewalk chalk. Make a pretty picture. And how about the colors, Frederick? They asked anxiously. Ooh, I like that tag too. Asked anxiously. Close your eyes again, Frederick said. And when he told them of the blue periwinkles, the red poppies in the yellow wheat, and the green leaves of the berry bush, they saw the colors as clearly as if it had been painted in their minds. Look at them imagining colors. Isn't that amazing what you can do with your imagination? And, and the words, Frederick? Frederick cleared his throat, <clears throat> waited a moment, and then as if from a stage he said, Who scatters snowflakes? Who melts the ice? Who spoils the weather? Who makes it nice? 
Who grows the four-leaf clovers in June? Who dims the daylight? Who lights the moon? Four little field mice who live in the sky. Four little field mice like you and I. One in the is the spring mouse who turns on the showers. Then comes the summer who paints in the flowers. The fall mouse is next with walnuts and wheat. And winter as last with little cold feet. Aren't we lucky? The four, the seasons are four. Think of a year with one less or one more. When Frederick had finished, they all applauded. But Frederick, they said, you're a poet. Who do you think makes the four seasons and brings all of those things into nature? Frederick blushed, took a bow, and said shyly, I know it. And that is Frederick by Leo Leone. The pictures are done by him as well. And they are collages. See if you can make a collage of you and your family and where you live, just like Frederick did. So, who was the main character? Where did it take place? Was there a problem? And what was the solution if there was? All right, that's the end of our picture book time, and now I'm going to go into our chapter book. The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. This is from a series called The Chronicles of Narnia, and this book does not come chronologically. This is not the first book chronologically in the series of books, but it's the first one that C.S. Lewis told to, I think his nephew, if I'm not mistaken. If you know for sure who he told it to, email me and let me know. And let's see. Oh, here is a map of Narnia. I think we're going to go into the world of Narnia. It's a special place, boys and girls. If you've read this book, you know how wonderful it is. And you might want to go ahead and go to the next book in the series. And the next book in the series, let me find it for you, is book two, and it's Prince Caspian. Okay? Now, like I said, it's not necessarily chronological order, but these are the orders in which C.S. Lewis originally wrote them. Here's the title page. It, this, this particular series that I have is illustrated by Pauline Baines, but there are many, many different illustrators for these, uh, for these uh, stories. And it was written in 1950 by C.S. Lewis. And here's the dedication. To Lucy Barfield. My dear Lucy, I wrote this story for you, but when I began it, I had not realized that girls grow quicker than books. As a result, you are already too old for fairy tales, and by the time it is printed and bound, you will be older still. But some days, some day, you will be old enough to start reading fairy tales again. You can then take it down from the upper shelf, dust it, and tell me what you think of it. I shall probably be too deaf to hear and too old to understand a word you say, but I shall still be. Your affectionate godfather, C.S. Lewis. Okay, so there are 17 chapters. And here's chapter one. Lucy looks into the wardrobe. Once there were four children whose names were Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy. This story is about something that happened to them when they were sent away from London during the war because of the air raids. They were sent to the house of an old professor who lived in the heart of the country, 10 miles from the nearest railway station and 2 miles from the nearest post office. He had no wife and he lived in a very large house with a housekeeper called Mrs. McReady and three servants. Their names were Ivy, Margaret, and Betty but they do not come into the story much. 
He himself was very old, a very old man with shaggy white hair, which grew over most of his face as well as his head, and they liked him almost at once. But on the first evening when he came out to meet them at the front door, he was so odd-looking that Lucy, who was the youngest, was a little afraid of him, and Edmund, who was the next youngest, wanted to laugh and had to keep on pretending he was blowing his nose to hide it. Have you ever done that, that you're laughing and you kind of have to hold it down because you don't want to get in trouble for laughing at an inappropriate time? I have. I get tickled about things, especially like when I'm nervous or if something's really serious. I kind of get this, this urge to laugh, and um, I know it's inappropriate. My father used to get on to me about that but I think it was just my reaction to things and still is today. As, the, as soon as they said goodnight to the professor and had gone upstairs on the first night, the boys came into the girls' room and they all talked it over. We've fallen on our feet and no mistake, said Peter. This is going to be perfectly splendid. That old chap will let us do anything we like. I think he's an old dear, said Susan. Oh, come off it, said Edmund, who was tired and pretending not to be tired, which always made him bad-tempered. Don't go on talking like that. Like what, said Susan. And anyway, it's time you were in bed. Trying to talk like mother, said Edmund. And who are you to say when I'm to go to bed? Go to bed yourself. Hadn't we all better go to bed, said Lucy. There's sure, sure to be a row if we were heard talking here. No, there won't, said Peter. I tell you, this is the sort of house where no one's going to mind what we do. Anyway, they won't hear us. It's about ten minutes' walk from here down to the dining room and any amount of stairs and passages in between. What's that noise? said Lucy suddenly. It was a far larger house than she had ever been in before, and the thought of all those long passages and rows of doors leading into empty rooms was beginning to make her feel a little creepy. It's only a bird, silly, said Edmund. It's an owl, said Peter. This is going to be a wonderful place for birds. I shall go to bed now. I say let's go and explore tomorrow. You might find anything in a place like this. Did you see those mountains as we came along? And the woods? There might be eagles. There might be stags. There'll be hawks. Badgers, said Lucy. Foxes, said Edmund. Rabbits, said Susan. But when next morning came, there was a steady rain falling, so thick, that when you looked out of the window, you could see neither the mountains nor the woods, nor even the stream in the garden. Of course it would be raining, said Edmund. They had just finished their breakfast with the professor and were upstairs in the room he had set apart for them, a long, low room with two windows looking out into the direction, into one direction and two in another. Do stop grumbling, Ed said Susan. Ten to one, it'll clear up in an hour or so, and in the meantime, we're pretty well off. There's a wireless and lots of books. A wireless is just a radio. Uh, a lot of times nowadays, we only have radios in our cars, but a wireless was a radio, and it was like a box that you would have in your house. It might, might even have antennas. You can look on the internet if your parents will let you, so you can see what it looks like. Now, as you can tell, this this story takes place in England, and the reason we know that is because, remember what it said earlier? It said that the children took a train from London to the countryside, and uh, so they're, they're referring to London, England. So you can look that up on a map and see if you can find it. Not for me, said Peter. I'm going to explore the house. Everyone agreed to this, and that was how the adventures began. It was the sort of house that you never seemed to come to the end of, and it was full of unexpected places. The first few doors 
they tried, led on into spare rooms, as everyone had expected that they would. But soon they came to a very long room full of pictures, and there they found a suit of armor. And after that was a room all hung with green, with a harp in one corner, and then came three steps down and five steps up, and then kind of a little upstairs hall and a door that led out onto a balcony, and then a whole series of rooms that led into each other and were lined with books, most of them very old books, and some bigger than a Bible in a church. And shortly after that, they looked into a room that was quite empty except for one big wardrobe, the sort that has a looking glass in the door. There was nothing else in the room at all except a dead blue bottle on the windowsill. So here's a picture of the wardrobe, and uh, your parents may call it an armoire, and you open it up, and inside it, so there was a looking glass, so that's another name for a mirror. So you open it up and you've got a mirror and inside you can hang your clothes and there may be a couple of drawers at the bottom that you could put some folded clothes. But a lot of times these were just opened up for hanging clothes. So we're gonna find out if we know more about wardrobes later on. And do you remember what I said another word for a wardrobe is? Armoire, it's a French word. A lot of our words come from other languages, like French, uh, like garage. Garage is a, um, and you, a lot of you may have garages in your homes. All right, I've lost my place. Oh, here it is. Nothing there, said Peter. And they all trooped out again, all except Lucy. She stayed behind because she thought it would be worthwhile trying the door of the wardrobe, even though it felt she felt almost sure that it would be locked. To her surprise, it opened quite easily, and two mothballs dropped out. I could hear them, and they'll just go out. And they're balls, so they're going to roll a little bit. And the odor, I don't know if you've ever smelled mothballs, but they have quite an odor. Looking into the inside, she saw several coats hanging, mostly long fur coats. There was nothing Lucy liked so much as the smell and feel of fur. She immediately stepped into the wardrobe and got in among the coats and rubbed her face against them, leaving the door open, of course, because she knew that it was a very fool it was a very foolish to shut oneself into a wardrobe. Soon she went further and found that there was a second row of coats hanging behind the first. It was almost quite dark in there and she kept her arms stretched out in front of her so not to bump her face against the back of the wardrobe. She took a step further in and then two or three steps always expecting to feel wood work against the tips of her finger but she could not feel it. This must be a simply enormous wardrobe, thought Lucy, going still further in and pushing the soft folds of the coats aside to make room for her. Then she noticed that there was something crunching under her feet. Hmm. I wonder if that... Is that more mothballs? She thought, stooping down to fill it with her hand. But instead of feeling the hard, smooth wood of the floor of the wardrobe, she felt something soft and powdery and extremely cold. That's very odd, she said, and went a step or two further. I wonder what she was feeling. She said that it was soft and powdery and cold. What do you think it could be? Next moment, she found that what was rubbing against her face and hands was no longer soft fur, but something hard and rough and even prickly. Why, it is just like branches of a tree, exclaimed Lucy. And then she saw that there was a light ahead of her. Not a few inches away where the back of the wardrobe ought to have been, but a long way off. Something cold and soft was falling on her. Hmm. 
you wonder what would be soft and cold falling on her. She's in a wardrobe. A moment later, she found that she was standing in the middle of a wood at nighttime with snow under her feet and snowflakes falling, falling through the air. Lucy felt a little frightened, but she felt very inquisitive and excited as well. She looked back over her shoulder, and there between the dark tree trunks, she could still see the open doorway of the wardrobe and even catch a glimpse of the empty room from which she had set out. She had, of course, left the door open, for she knew that it is a very silly thing to shut oneself in a wardrobe. It seemed to be still daylight there. I can always get back if anything goes wrong, thought Lucy. She began to walk forward, crunch, crunch, over the snow and through the woods toward the other light. In about ten minutes, she reached it and found it was a lamp post. As she stood looking at it, wondering why there was a lamp post in the middle of the wood and wondering what to do next, she heard the pitter-patter of feet coming toward her, and soon after that, a very strange person stepped out from among the trees into the light of the lamp post. Lamp post. Okay, here's a picture of the lamp post. He was only a little taller than Lucy herself, and he carried over his head an umbrella white with snow. From the waist upward, he was like a man, but his legs were shaped like a goat's. The hair on them was glossy black, and instead of feet, he had goat's hoofs. He also had a tail, but Lucy did not notice that at first because he was it was neatly caught up over his arm that held the umbrella so as to keep it from trailing off in the snow. He had a wet red woolen muffler around his neck. See, I have something around my neck. It's a scarf. It's If it were thick and woolly and, and knitted, it might be called a muffler. And his skin was rather reddish, too. He had a strange but pleasant little face with a short pointed beard and curly hair. And out of the hair, there stuck two horns one on either side of, side of his forehead. One of his hands, as I have said, held the umbrellas. In the other arm, he carried several brown paper parcels. What with the parcels and the snow, it looked just as if he'd been doing his Christmas shopping. He was a fawn, and when he saw Lucy, he gave such a start of surprise that he dropped his parcels. Oh, oh, oh goodness! Gracious, oh goodness gracious me, exclaimed the fawn. And that is the end of chapter one. I'll be on again tomorrow to read chapter two, as, as well as the other uh, stories that I preceded. I hope you have a great rest of the day. Look for some other videos from other teachers at White Station and um, take care and be healthy. I love you and miss you all.